Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Psalm 512 NIV. Through this deadly coronavirus pandemic of 2020, the Lord has truly blessed our Mount Nebo family and friends. He has surrounded our pastor with his divine favor as he has continued to feed us the word of God and pray with us every Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday through it all. Yes, our pastor for three years has been leading with the divine favor of God. Now, let us show our appreciation by celebrating Pastor Danny L. McKenzie Sr. and Lady Patricia McKenzie on Saturday, October 24th, 2020, with a drive-by parade lining up at Oswald Park at 3.45 p.m. The three best decorated cars will receive a very special recognition. Pastor will be blessed again on Sunday, October 25th, 2020, at 10 a.m., during our virtual worship service when his third anniversary word from God will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Alfonso Jackson Sr. of Second Baptist Church of Richmond Heights. How can you say thanks? Members and friends, please express your love to Pastor and Lady McKenzie for all that they have done for us by sending your love offering through Cash App at dollar sign Dan one three two eight or Zell at three five two four five five six six seven nine. More information will be forthcoming from our ministry leaders and our church clerk. Please contact Deaconess Iola Glenn or Deaconess Vernell Morgan should you have questions. May God bless you abundantly for blessing Pastor and Lady Mackenzie. Thank you. Good evening, Mount Nebo Church families. We praise God tonight for another opportunity to study his word, but most of all, to also give him praise, honor, and adoration. God has truly been good to us, and so we give him praise tonight. In spite of all the rain that we've experienced over this last weekend, we give God glory for the rain, because rain does have and serve a distinct purpose uh, when you think about rain, rain not only causes things to grow, but rain also serves as a cleansing agent. It cleanses things and washes debris away. So we praise God for the rain and we give him all the honor and certainly all the glory. Tonight, I want to invite you to go with me to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 40. And we want to look at verse 31, very familiar uh, verse and text as the word of the Lord says, verse 31, King James Version, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. I want to use this text tonight really as a foundational piece. I won't deal so much directly with the text itself, but use it as a, a for a thematic emphasis with this uh, subject in mind, if you will. Lord, teach me to wait. Lord, teach me to wait. Now, that's a very interesting request and subject matter to address because the truth of the matter is most people don't like to wait. We despise long checkout lines. For some, it's the long wait at the red light that really gets up on their skin. The present makeup of our culture places a large emphasis on the fact that we can not only have what we want, but we can have it right now. However, beloved, God knows there is value in learning to wait on him. So he allows us to be placed in settings, places, and circumstances where we have no choice, no other alternative, but to wait on him. Uh, I remember the days when growing up that we would wait for dinner 
to be ready. My mother would start cooking in the early, early in the afternoon. She made everything from scratch and it took time to chop, to mix, to cook, for things to simmer, and then finally to be served. She was a great cook, so the end result was always going to be great, but to make what we call good soul food, down home cooking, it involved waiting. And we can't match the results of that effort today. We try to duplicate it by popping food in the microwave or substituting one ingredient for the other. We think that we will arrive at the same end, we'll have the same results, that the sweet potato pie will taste the same, but it doesn't because somewhere along the way, we have left out some vital ingredients and one of those vital ingredients is time mixing and shaping the crust of the pie. It takes time to do that stuff by hand. My mom would sit there and she would literally go around the edges of the, of the pan and, and make her own little indentations to formalize the crust on the pie. It takes time to do that. Hurry in the process by taking shortcuts just doesn't produce the same result. Some things, beloved, just simply take time. Waiting, however, is never easy. There is such a feeling of helplessness when we are forced into a situation in which we cannot do anything except wait on God. When we think of waiting, we might envision just sitting back, not doing much of anything, just waiting for something to happen. But that is not the kind of waiting the Bible is calling for. Perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of waiting is learning how to hold the negatives and the positives in proper balance. What do you mean by that, Mackenzie? I'm glad you asked. When, when you have something negative happen in your life, we tend to want to force the issue into, I gotta make something happen. I have to move rapidly because this is spiraling or this is moving in the wrong direction. Sometimes it's good to have setbacks. Again, you ask the question, why do you say that? Well, think about it for a moment. You rushing out the door. You, you said, I'm already running late. I gotta get to work on time. I'm already running late. You get to the car, you discover you left your keys to the car. You run back in the house, grab the keys, and you come back to the car. And you say, oh gosh, I'm, I'm gonna be late. And you forgot, I left my cell phone on the dresser. Now I run back in the house, turn the alarm off, pick the cell phone up, rush out the door again to get in the car and you head out on your way to work only to discover there's an accident two blocks away from your house. And then you realize that in all of that, those, those interruptions, if you will, you end up saying, God, I thank you that I wasn't involved in the accident. God saw things even before we see them. And so sometimes those interruptions, sometimes those setbacks, they have a purpose, but in our mind, they're just interruptions that, that we got to make uh, extra effort in order to speed the clock up. And so sometimes God makes us wait. We have to learn to hold both the negatives and the positives in proper balance. We learn some of life's greatest lessons through the lame fulfillment. God promised to reward those who submit to his timing. God acts on behalf of those who are willing to wait on him. But let me tell you tonight, that is not something new that I'm going to share, just a reminder, if you will. Waiting takes patience. Waiting takes patience. Lamentations 3 and 25, New American Standard Bible says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. God does not tease us or string us along as we wait on him. He is working all things together.
together for our good and for his glory. That's really the essence of Romans 8 and 28. When we quote that passage, we say, and we know that all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. Well, what does that verse really mean? That verse is saying to us that even in the midst of negative situations, God is at work in the midst of what's going on. It may not feel good. It may not seem good. It may not even be good at that time, but God has a way of taking what is a negative and transforming that and making something good come out of a bad situation. I want to tell you tonight that God specializes in taking lemons and making lemonade. If you can adapt that methodology in your mind and grasp the understanding that even in negative situations, God is at work. He's at work because he has an end already in mind and it's going to work out for our good and for his glory. We must also remember that we're not waiting simply for an outcome. Let me say that again tonight. We must also remember that we're not waiting simply for an outcome. We are waiting on God. That's a big difference. That's a big difference because there are some people who are simply waiting. I, I want to see how this is going to turn out. Let, let me, since we're in this season of, of election, we're, some of us are waiting to see how the election is going to turn out. Can I just tell you something tonight? God already knows how it's going to turn out. We are waiting on the outcome. God already knows how things are going to turn out. And so we're not waiting on the outcome. No matter what happens, we are waiting on the Lord and we're going to move as he gives divine direction. And that's where we got to understand. Doesn't matter who's sitting or who's staying at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue at as long as God is still on the throne, everything is going to be all right. I want to encourage somebody with that tonight because we're waiting on the outcome of what's going to happen at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm not waiting on the outcome of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm waiting on the outcome of God because God can take a bad king and use him for his glory. Somebody oh, talk to me tonight. God can take a bad king and call him to do some great things in the land. I don't care who's sitting where because the Bible says the heart of the king is in God's hand and God can use whomever he wills. Hmm. Waiting on him no matter how long the process seems to take, we will have the best results when we wait on God. Here it is. Zephaniah 3 and 8 says, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day will when I arise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. When we stop turning away from God and turn back to God, then God will, will do what he has already designed to do. We've got to do what we're supposed to do. We, we're waiting again on the outcome, and God says, I'm waiting on you to turn to me. Talk to me tonight. God says, I'm waiting on my people. Here it is. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then that, that's, the, that's the end result. There's some activity that has to take place with humanity. And God says, y'all waiting on me. He says, I'm waiting on y'all. Uh, Psalms 33 and 20. Our souls wait for the Lord. Here's our help and our shield. The psalmist proclaims that we wait and depend. We wait and we depend. We wait and we depend on God for his deliverance and his salvation. 
Deliverance is certain because his people are willing to depend on him. Uh, have you ever wanted to move, to act, to take control of a situation, but God was telling you to wait, to slow down, and trust me? Let me, let me, let me ask that question again because I don't think he caught me. Have you ever wanted to move, to act, to take control of a situation? You said, listen, uh, I, I know God may not come when you want him, but right now I need to take control of this. And so we try to interject humanity into a God situation. And, and, and that never goes well for us because God always is trying or he's always conveying something to us that so often we miss because we get in too big of a hurt. So have you ever wanted to move, act, take control of a situation, but God was telling you to wait, slow down, and trust me? Psalms 40, verse 1, 2, and 3, Amplified says, I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord. Here it is. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit of torment and of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, steadying my footsteps and establishing my path. He put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear with great reverence and will trust confidently in the Lord. If you have time this week, just peruse Psalms 40 and, and begin to dissect those verses. Particularly if you look at verses 1, 2, and 3, there's so much in verses 1, 2, and 3 that if you are just allow that word to sink down, get down in the deep recesses of your heart, your mind, and your spirit, you will begin to understand that no matter where you are right now in your life, God is not only still in control, but he's trying to get us to learn how to wait on him. There are some things that the psalmist says will happen when we wait not only patiently, but expectantly on the Lord. Watch what he says. He says, he inclined to me, that is God paid attention to what I was saying and what I was doing. He watched me. He observed my, my actions and my reactions. And notice what he said. He heard my cry. Hmm. Didn't know what he does. God moves. He brought me out of a horrible pit. If you're in a bad situation, and you've been praying to God and you're wondering when is God going to move? When is God going to act on my behalf? He hears you and he moves when the timing is right. You, you know, my, my brothers and I, we, 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 we pray. We have a group prayer every month. And one of the conversations we had recently, we were talking about the fact that sometimes when, when your season is up and God is saying it's time to, for you to move, and you say, well, man, everything is going well. I think I'm going to just stay right here. You can stay and still be blessed, but you will miss the greater blessings when you don't move when God says move. You, you have to learn that no matter how great that situation might be, no matter how good it may be going, when, when your spirit, my brother used the term, he says, I feel like my spirit is lifting from this place and I've got to move to where God is instructing me to move. And so when we don't move with God, we miss the greater blessings and we miss the fact of being able to be a blessing to somebody else. Because watch this now. Jesus, the Bible says that he must needs go through Samaria. Watch the text. Watch the text. He must needs go through Samaria in John. Why would he have to go through Samaria? Well, where he was headed, it was quicker not to go through Samaria. But you missed the key word in the text. He must needs go through Samaria. Well, who did he meet after going through Samaria? He met the woman at the well. Hmm. 
what happens in that dialogue with Jesus and the woman at the well. She comes to the well. She comes to get physical water. Jesus offers her spiritual internal water. And, 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 he, and he has this dialogue. And after talking with her, and they converse back and forth one another, the woman, the text says, dropped her water pots, ran back in the town, and said to the men of the town, Is not this the Christ? Mm. Y'all miss it? There was a need. Had he stayed where he was, there would have never been any interaction with the woman at the well. Thus, there would never been any salvation that came to the town. Ah, my God, my God. Yes, you can stay where you are and still be blessed. But the greater blessing is in following the divine directions of God. Notice what the psalmist says. Let me get back to the, to the lesson that we he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Watch what he does. He set my feet upon a rock. God reestablishes me. God reestablishes you. And then he doesn't do it half-heartedly. Notice what the psalmist says. Steady in my footsteps and establishing my path. Then watch what he does. You think it's over at that point. It ain't over. Watch what he said. He says, and then he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Listen, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. That's the song he puts in your mouth. And it's a song of praise to him. Whenever God brings you out, don't you be so stingy with your praise that you forget to return and give him glory. You, you, you got to hear me tonight. You got to hear me tonight. Don't get so caught up in the fact that you feel like, oh, I did this all by myself. And you start to poke your chest out. No, 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 no. If it wasn't for the Lord, you and I wouldn't be where we are right now. And so we owe God a song of praise. And he says, many will see and fear with great reverence and will trust confidently in the Lord. That's the part of being a blessing to others. When you start professing, no, I wouldn't be where I am had it not been for the Lord. If God had opened this door, I wouldn't be here right now. But because God opened the door, others will see and hear your praise and it will cause them to now trust in the same God that you believe in. Hmm. What happened? When we refuse to wait on God. When we refuse to wait on God, we miss the provisions of God. Hear me? When we refuse to wait on God, we miss the provisions of God. Here's what we end up doing. We end up settling for good when God has us on the path to greatness. Are we seeking convenience and comfort or permanent and purpose? That's the question I got for you. You seeking convenience and comfort or are you seeking permanent and purpose? Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 amplifies says, he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. Remain in expectation or waiting for the Lord in our lives is necessary and according to the scriptures to receive the Lord's blessings. Prophet Isaiah practiced what he preached as he waited for the Lord to act in his life and the life of the nation. Blessed or happy are those who go through the waiting period the Lord decrees for each of us. The nine months of waiting for a child to be born is more than repaid at the child's birth. Same is true for those who wait upon the Lord. For Isaiah said, he acts on their behalf. So waiting teaches us patience. But then secondly, and I'm almost done, waiting will produce inner strength. Waiting will produce inner strength. 
trying to control or influence circumstances depletes our energy. Whenever we're trying to manipulate situations and circumstances, we end up exhausting ourselves. Actively waiting and patiently waiting on God will give the believer newfound strength. When we allow him to strengthen us for the assignments we're called to perform, he can experience supernatural energy. That's the essence of when he said, they shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's because you are not running or operating on your own strength. You're operating under the divine strength of the Holy Spirit. So waiting teaches us patience, but then waiting will produce inner strength. But then lastly, we see the fulfillment of our faith. Isaiah 49 and 23 says, those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. In the end, the believer will never be ashamed when they choose to wait on God. When others attempt to encourage us to move ahead, we need to remember that God's plans and timing are always best. He knows our strengths, weaknesses, our likes and dislikes better than anyone else even better than we know our own selves. We must always remember, as the psalmist says in Psalms 31 and 15, our times are in his hands. He holds and controls our future. Don't allow tonight circumstances to entice you to take matters into your own hands. God has a purpose for all you experience. Ephesians 1 11 says the Father works all things after the counsel of his will. Sometimes it seems as if God is not answering our prayers. I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm a witness myself that sometimes it just seems like God hasn't heard anything I said. Sometimes I'm not always as patient as I should be. So while I'm teaching you, I'm being taught myself. At the same thing I'm saying to you, the Holy Spirit is convicting me of the same thing. So I don't want you to walk away tonight thinking, oh, pastor has great faith. No, not in every situation and not in every circumstance. That sometimes I'm more impatient than some of you probably are because I'm saying, God, why don't you move now? Why don't you move right now in this situation? And God continues to remind me, Mackenzie, I know what's best for you. Although your weary eyes, they can't see, they don't understand. I know what's down the road. I know what's around the corner. And if you trust me, everything will be all right. There are those times we need to remind ourselves that he is the living God. He is with us at every moment. He is in control of all life. And he is working for our good. Be patient tonight. And trust what God is doing in your life. When we refuse to wait on God's time, we miss out on his provisions, we miss out on his power, and we miss out on his presence. God is good to those who wait on him. Lord, teach me how to wait. God bless you tonight. Again, certainly we hope and pray that something that we've been blessed to share with you tonight has been a blessing to you. Pray tonight that you would trust God and wherever you find yourself at tonight, that if you're wrestling with a decision, trust God in what he is instructing you to do, what he's saying, what his spirit is saying to you. Trust him. It may, not, it may seem crazy. It may seem far out and left field as the old folks will say to you right now. But if you just trust what God is doing, I promise you everything will be all right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again tonight. We give you honor, we give you glory, and most of all, we give you praise. Lord, help us tonight to learn how to wait on you, to trust what you're doing. For your word declares that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast out. God, we give you all the honor, we give you all the praise. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask and trust. Amen. God bless you. Until next time, Lord, teach me how to wait.